Jessica Strand, the events director. And no, I have no relation to the Bass family that owns the bookstore. It's a very odd coincidence. I'm thrilled to host and to partner with the Penn American Center and Public Space to bring you this wonderful event, a tribute to Ava Zeisel. Um, please join me in welcoming the director of the World Voices Festival for the Penn American Center, Jakob Orshish. Good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is my absolute pleasure to welcome you here tonight. This is our first event at the Strand Bookstore. Thank you, Jessica, Jessica Strand, and her wonderful team. And hope we hope that many more events like this will follow. In fact, we're going to be here in two weeks. Uh, tonight is a is a birthday celebration, believe it or not. I don't know how many of you know that this is actually Eva Stasel's birthday. She was born in 1906, December 13th, 1906. No, so no. Oh, November is November 13th. So this is this is a perfect uh, perfect time. We were actually aiming to this day. So happy birthday, Eva! She had an amazing life. I was very fortunate to to know her. She was an exceptional talent, as many of you probably know. And she embraces her life, embraces everything what Penn stands for talent, bravery, and freedom of expression. So when we, and I've learned about the fact that the e-book came out with her prison memoirs, and I've read the experts, excerpts of, of, of her book at a public space, you'll hear about it soon, I knew that we want to do something with this, with the fact that the book came out, and, with, and celebrating her exceptional life. So Can you hear me? Good. Good evening. It's a real great pleasure for me to talk to you, and especially in this premises. It reminds me of the Budapest bookstore, an antiquariat as it was called. I worked there almost 70 years ago, and it was exactly the same atmosphere and the same type of people, and uh, members of the Polanyi family or the or the, uh, the Stricker family could very well have been there. It was immediately after World War II that I was employed there. Uh, yes, uh, let's begin with 1906 in the few minutes that I have at my disposal. Uh, it was, as practically every year in Hungarian history, a crucial year. This was when the opposition tried to overthrow the government, and the government tried to overthrow the opposition. Uh, because of what was the issue? The main issue was not ethnic question, not social question, not the problem that there were three million people who had no land in Hungary, not that the industrial proletariat was very badly paid, not that Hungary was at the same time moving ahead at fantastic space. The issue in 1906 was what the language of command should be in the Hungarian regiment of the Austro-Hungarian army. And the language of command, the Hungarians wanted it to be Hungarian for the Hungarian regiment, and the others wanted it, all of it to be German. The trouble was that more than half of the Hungarian regiment had soldiers who were not Hungarians, just members of the minorities who didn't Hungarian, so it didn't make any difference what language they did not understand. <laughs> but still, the commands were given to them. Now it was, uh, let uh, now concentrate on Budapest because Budapest was so different from the rest of the countryside and in many ways a marvelous place. It developed incredibly fast, uh, early 19th century, maybe 50,000 people, then 100,000 people. By 1906, there were well over a million people there living there in uh, relative prosperity, at least certain classes of it. Uh, and the whole country was just bursting with energy, uh, liberal capitalist energy, even had what I would call imperialist dreams. Hungary itself, which was a member of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, calls itself the Hungarian Empire, but it was in reality a kingdom. If you want to know more about what Budapest was uh, 1900 in, at that time, I cannot say very much in a few minutes. I would like to recommend John Lukács's book, Budapest 1900. It's just a wonderful book with wonderful pictures. If I don't mind, I can circulate it. Look at least the pictures. It will tell you much more than I can say. Uh, now, here comes the f these families that are in vaguely described as the Polanyi, originally Polacek family, who were very successful Hungarians of Jewish origin. This is something that one has to emphasize all the time. Hungarians, in the first 
first place, but consciously and uh, aware of the fact, and of course the public was aware of that, that they were a Jewish origin. Uh, one of its members was extremely successful, uh, for a while at least, he was a railroad builder, uh, but then bankrupt, as so many people did from time to time, and so the uh, family was not as rich as it should have been, but had a great deal of prestige, and the Polanyis, or Pol Polacek origin, the Pol Polanyis, think of Michael, think of Karl, and others, were uh, the belonged to the highest intellectual elite in Hungary. They had, by Jews had been emancipated by that time, uh, by stages, first in 1848-49, revolution, then 1867, when Hungary and Austria became partners in, a, in, a, in this dual, dual monarchy, and then 1895, which was very controversial, because the Jewish religion was made equal, totally equal to the Christian denominations, and marriage, for instance, mixed marriage was allowed between Jews and Catholic without the Jews converting, which aggravated the church no end. So we always have to keep in mind that there is in the background a very powerful, extremely rich Catholic church and some Protestants also who are viewing the development, viewing the liberal changes, viewing the capitalist development, viewing the success of the Jews with uh, very jaundiced eye because it, it's all their power is threatened and genuinely threatened by it. Um, for Jews, by 1906, possibilities seemed absolutely infinite. Not only that they could create business, they, they and other immigrants, mostly from the West, Germans, Englishmen, Belgians, skilled laborers, industrialists, created Hungarian industry and business. But most of the force that, that pushed forward were Jewish immigrants, either from the West or from Galicia. And they could do practically everything they wanted. It's customary to say that all Jews were excluded from certain professions still. No, it is not quite true, but they had to convert. If the incidentally, if you've seen the film Sunshine by Istvan Sabo, then again, you have seen everything. You don't, I don't, you don't need me for that. It's very well explained. Yes, they could be judges, they could be university professors, they could be career officers. With the expectations that sooner or later, at least they would change their names from a German name to a Hungarian name, from Sonnenfeld uh, to Schorsch, and in the film, uh, and then also convert, and if everything was well, mixed, enter into mixed marriage and will come, become really like the other Hungarians. Here is Karl Mannheim, who during World War I served as a cavalry officer in reserve, which is a fantastic thing that shows how wealthy the family was, because only wealthy Jews were accepted into the cavalry. But he was there. And who, why were so many Jewish cavalry officers or Jewish officers in general? Because you needed high school degree. And 30, 40 percent of the high school students were Jews in Hungary. And that already tells you again a problem. The problem is that whereas the Jews are only 5% of the population, they are 30-40% of the officer course, 30-40% of the university students, 50% of the lawyers, 60% of the journalists, and so on and so forth. And always the best journalists, the best lawyers. Well, obviously others didn't like it. That is inevitably. But who would not have how to prevent it. Nobody knew how to prevent it because Hungary had been divided into really two societies, serfs and noblemen, and some merchants, mostly of German origin, the burghers, who could not keep up with modernization. So help had to come, and the help came from the West in persons, for instance, German and Swiss uh, industrialists, but mostly Jews, who then built the Hungarian industry, Hungarian commerce, which the nobility was quite satisfied with so long as the Jews did not want to become cavalry officers. When they became cavalry officers, this thing became much more difficult. But it worked until 1914, I would say, until the war, and there were incredible scenes of Jews and non-Jews mixing and meeting. If you look at this book, and this, uh, there is one picture of uh, uh, Hungarians in their national co alleged national costume, which was a joke. It was an invention of German 
German tailors in the 19th century, imagined how Hungarians looked in the 9th century when they allegedly came to Hungary, even that is disputed. Uh, but, and now if you look at, for instance, the Hungarian Minister of Defense in nine, between 1910 and 1907, General Hazai, and he would uh, have the picture at home, but not here. He looks, of course, he's in Hungarian national costume, nothing but diamonds and pearls and feathers and sword, of course. And uh, But his real name was Kuhn. And he was still accepted and recognized, together with so many others, like the Polanyi family, as uh, people who move, help Hungary move forward. And uh, they had they had their hands everywhere, if you want to be nasty about it, or they had their brain and talent everywhere, uh, and things moved quite well. But they had no political power. And this is what Hannah Arendt, for instance, in her book talked about, how incredible it is that Jews who make up 25% of the population of Budapest, they could have made the biggest party in Budapest if they wanted to, uh, had no political party, they voted either independent party or mostly government party, so-called government party, or some of them were social democrats, uh, and uh, that made their position, of course, very unstable because they could be this Schlaraffenland, as the Germans call it, could have ended any times. And Hungary had great problems. And most of the greatest problem was, of course, that Hungarians, Magyar speakers, were just barely 50% of the population by 1900. And why were they 50% and then uh, allegedly by 19 53%? Because of assimilation. And Germans and Slavs and others assimilated quite happily into Hungarian. Always try to be, not bourgeois, but try to be gentry. Every Jew dreamed of buying a land, of getting a title of nobility, wear a sword, ride horseback, as they did a lot. And for instance, the Millennium Celebration, you see all the fat Hungarian Jewish capitalists on horseback with the aristocrats. So that, we have arrived. That's, that's what we want. But that doesn't solve the social problems. It doesn't solve the ethnic problems. And the ethnic minorities, the Slavs, different varieties of Slavs and the Romanians and others, wanted the same that Hungarians had got from the emperor, from Francis Joseph, that is their own autonomy. Uh, there was also the terrible problem of the backwardness of the countryside, which uh, could not uh, be uh, elevated from one minute to another. Budapest is modern. Budapest knows cubists and, and uh, abstract painters, and the countryside thinks in terms of Hungarian ancestors uh, fighting for the land. I mean, this, uh, that Hungary had great problems was understood by a few intellectuals, and only by a few intellectuals. Again, who are these intellectuals? Jewish, young Jewish radicals, university students, among them Michael Polanyi, uh, the uncle, one of the uncles of, of uh, our heroine here, uh, who founded the Galilei Circle. And the Galilei Circle pointed out together with others, Hungarian poets like Odi, who was not Jewish, uh, to the problems of Hungary. But it's very hard to persuade a, a, a public which it feels that it's moving ahead that it's, uh, the future is dark. And the future came in the form of the war. And that changed everything. For a few m moments, it looks wonderful because the Jews were enthusiastic about the war. It was a war against reactionary, anti-Semitic, pogromist Russia. So they had, they had a common cause with other Hungarians. Uh, but uh, the war was fought for four years. The first sufferings were unbelievable. Hungary lost a half a million people who died. And even worse, Austria-Hungary, just consider this, lost two and a half million prisoners of war. Two and a half million young Austrians and Hungarians, which included Italians, Poles, Ukrainians, Serbs, 11 nationality. They all wandered into POW camps in, in Siberia. Another two and a half million Russians ended in Austrian, in German POW camps. And the population exchanged five years, six years without seeing their family, seeing each other. Uh, the complications, 
that arise for that. So it was a very hard time. And then the anti-Semitism which was existed before, of course it existed, it always exists, came to the fore. Because for instance, uh, Jews were not serving in the infantry. Why didn't serve in the infantry? Because they were better than infantry. Infantry men were poor peasant boys who didn't know anything, didn't even know how to read and write, they put in the infantry. 90% of the casualties in World War I were infantry casualties. So that the artillery was better. Uh, of course, Jews spoke languages, they spoke German, so they served in offices. That was seen as shirking, as, as not doing one's patriotic duty. Nevertheless, many did. Many did, and about uh, uh, they had earned medals, and many of them died. But the public began to see them as different, as enemies. And then there was also uh, the war profiteers, the black market, which was existed, and of course Jews had better abilities in going into the black market than a Hungarian peasant. So there were more black marketers among Jews. Another reason, the church became very active in anti-Semitic propaganda. Uh, and then 1918, the whole thing collapsed. But I think I talked too long already. I'm very interested. Can I talk on? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, all right. Uh, well, I will try to make it short. So 1918, what happens? The front collapses. But nobody wants to admit that Hungary and oh, Germany especially, which has troops everywhere abroad. Really, you must remember that. Uh, that's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I have just one second. <laughs> I'm talking, but I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I hope it's not something very important. <laughs> oh, now I feel badly about it. Um, so, no, oh, now I have four minutes. Well, I will go, go ahead a little bit. So, 1918 brings the great crisis because everything collapses. The war is lost, which of course the public doesn't like to admit because its troops are all abroad. There is not a single enemy soldier in October 1918, the territory of Austria Hungary or Germany. And from there comes, of course, the stab in the back legend. If there is no enemy, we are not defeated. Why have we lost the war? But they lost the war because they couldn't fight on anymore, and people didn't want to fight anymore. So came revolutions, first the democratic revolution, and then a socialist communist revolution, in which the majority of the so-called people's commissars are Jewish. And with which even rich people, rich intellectuals like the Polanyis, to a certain degree sympathize, although the Polanyis' political views are an incredibly complicated thing, which I cannot quite follow. But uh, this, uh, then people began to associate in their mind, the country people especially, defeat, so Trianon Peace Treaty in which two-thirds of Hungary is lost, two-thirds, there's over three million Hungarian speakers who now belong to other countries. Communist revolution, which is godless, which is wants to destroy the Holy Church, uh, which is against the old Hungarian traditions, and the Jews. And with that begins the counter-revolutionary period, and a much harder time, which drives innumerable people abroad, especially Jewish intellectuals, as a great loss to Hungary. And one of those will be Eva Zeisel. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, that was a hard act to follow. Um, I just wanted to say that, uh, thank you Bridget, thank you Jeannie, as always, for organizing all of this. And um, I wish all of you could have met Eva. Uh, the first time I talked to her, I verged on shocking, because first of all, I called her out of the blue as a graduate student, and no one talks to graduate students. Major artists, you know, recognized key figures of the 20th century, don't talk to graduate students. So that she answered the call herself was bizarre to me, and I was uh, found it difficult to talk to her. 
and I'm sure she didn't enjoy the conversation now that I think about it, but she went on to, I asked to speak to her because I was doing a dissertation on the Lomonosov of Porcelain Factory and one certain artist, and all of the artists who had worked there during the war had been classified as non-essential workers and had basically been starved to death during the Leningrad blockade. She had survived. Uh, I had somehow put it together that the Yeva Stricker, who'd worked at Lomonosov, was Eva Zeisel, the great 20th century ceramics designer. And I called her out of the blue and she said, well, you know, I survived by going to prison because the, uh, I was going to shoot Stalin. And I <laughs> didn't <laughs> quite know what to say to that. And uh, asked if I could speak to her. And then she told me that her husband was very ill. And uh, this was at the time her husband Hans was um, in his last illness. And she was still so kind to me to even speak to me for a half an hour. So I was hooked from the first time I ever spoke to her. And what I want to do really quickly is um, sort of take you through her Soviet career. Um, I think for those of you who aren't ceramics or modern design junkies who come to this more from a Hungarian perspective or a historical perspective, she is one of the key figures of 20th century design. The Cooper Hewitt Museum, when they chose their key event for today, chose one of her chose her birthday and one of her designs. Much of her work is kept at um, the Cooper Hewitt, and you see her there at work. Can we have the next one? When I said in the film, oh so long ago, that she um, was very smart about going to all the right places to get herself the right skills, uh, I just want to point out a few places. She was one of the 20th century's first true industrial designers, meaning that she had to produce designs. She wasn't a potter playing with um, clay. That's how she had started out. But she had to produce designs very quickly to be produced en masse. And as she described, she was a very young woman. She got hired basically by plumping up her resume and applying by mail to a factory in, in Schramberg in a place she had never worked in processes she did not know. And 350 people's jobs were depending on her. And she had to constantly innovate, create bright new things. And it was in earthenware. It was one of the uh, early 20th century examples of this stuff chips easily, and it's meant to, and you're supposed to replace it each year. So she had to replace new designs for each season, and as you can see, she started out designing bright colors, abstract shapes, you know, this was much of the influence of early modernism. Can we have the next one? When I said I was hooked, um, I went on to go to Russia to do my dissertation research. And while I was there, I met lots and lots of people who had been through the camps, who had family members who'd been through the camps. And um, she was the only one I ever met who came out of that. Ex There's a lot of ways to come out of that experience and to come out of her particular experience, which we would now call torture. She was. Um, isolated completely, we now recognize that as torture, and she came out of it happy and wanting to focus on the present mo moment, wanting to focus on color. I don't know anyone else who came out of it wanting to talk about it, and happy and joyful, and wanting to make things that you felt good about, that you wanted to touch. She was always wanting to show that these objects were in relation to the body, where, you know, she would always, she was always handing her porcelain or her ceramics to people, you know, saying, touch this, feel it, hug it. She wanted these things to be comforting. Could we have the next one? So when she was a young woman, very young woman, with no more Russian than she had in a dictionary with a little grammar at the back, I think she was crazy. <laughs> This is a tough country to, to get around in now as a foreigner. But with only that much information, she had a friend who was a physicist who had gotten a job in Kharkov, then the capital of Ukraine. And uh, she arranged to go visit him. 
And you can see she's quite, uh, there she is on the right in one of her family's archive photos. She was quite the young hipster in her, uh, or whatever they called it back then. But she had, uh, you see her tie and her cool jacket. And she's there with her brother who followed her there, her brother Michael, who was a patent attorney. And she described what really attracted her about it was the color, the rhythm, the hope, the idea that something artistically interesting and active was going on there. And sort of the only example I can really show you beyond what you already know from her own experience is on all of the major revolutionary holidays they would have the artists make these wonderful caricature figures and what you see there is a caricature of the social democratic party which um, several of her family members belong to and she took the picture to to poke at them to show them that this is as you can see it's a funny faced figure and it's making fun of them we have the next one so, as we can see, she's fearless and um, in the way that sometimes we are in our 20s. She'd already taken a job at Schramberg with no skills in mass production and no skills in, in earthenware. And with no Russian beyond some very basic skills, she finagled her way into a job. I'm, very, I'm shortening and leaving out some details. You'll just have to buy the book. Um, she got herself a job at the Lomonosov porcelain factory in St. Petersburg in Leningrad, and that is the former imperial porcelain factory. So she was now working with high fire porcelain, which forms completely differently, acts differently in the kiln, and she's having to deal with this social the governmental structure is, that's just come out with the idea of socialist realism. They've promulgated this as a method for all Soviet art. And while it might be easier to understand what it might mean for literature, what would socialist realism mean for ceramics? That was under debate the entire time she was there. I bet you've never thought about socialist realist ceramics. It has never occurred to you. And that might not be what you'd think. But the first way they interpreted it was that this stuff should, w there should be as many pieces available to as many people as possible. How can we get consumer goods out to this vast country with so many poor people? And she created designs that, as you can see, are very simplified, a simple cylinder, a simple handle that will stack in the kiln, that will stack in uh, in the storage areas, these were meant for all these social communal areas, like the, co um, the cafeteria at the factory, things like that. So this is what she sets out to do. Can we have the next one? Oh, and she has great success at it. As you can see, she's there up in the back row. This is a 1934 exhibition in which they consider that year's great achievements, and hers is one of them. That's a locking lid, where you don't have to hold the lid on the teapot. And in Russia, you drink a lot of tea. Let's, this is not a minor thing. This is the days before tea bags. Serious matter here. So she's demonstrating her locking lid, and she's with some other great figures there of 20th century Soviet ceramics going and here's what the um, Soviet party did with her great design for the masses you can see up there at the top right the simplified forms and what they decided to do was to take these forms that should have been mass-produced make just a few of them wildly paint them and um, give them out to only the very best workers for use in their own homes or for the nomenclatura for use in their own homes or to diplomats. They were the same kind of elite production the factory had been making in the 19th century. And in fact, um, what you see on the left is Stalin's favorite tea set, which is an old service from actually the 1920s with, or 1820s with new designs. Can we have the next one? And this is what 
they were doing with her porcelain designs while she was in prison. She had no idea. They were painting things up with these great propagandistic designs. I went to the factory with her and she was laughing because one of them showed people being sent away to the northern forests, kulaks being sent away to uh, rebuild. And this is what they were painting on her porcelain while she was in prison. But you see a piece there that is uh, devoted to the creation of the first Moscow Metro on the left. She did not design the tray. That's not practical. And that's not, <laughs> a, a porcelain tray is crazy. And on the right, you see a set that uh, is at Hillwood Museum. And there's another one at the Cooper Hewitt in which it it contrasts the old and new Soviet Union with the old, with old Russia. And the next one. Well, as you remember, she created these designs. They didn't actually put them into production until she was in prison, and even then, only for an elite. She got so frustrated with Lomonosov that she accepted a job at another factory called Julova outside Moscow. And there she just went crazy. She designed probably 20, 30 new designs, most of which we can't find now. All sorts of tea sets, wonderful iridescent glazes. She worked with a great guy called Pyotr Leonov. Some of this is at the Met. Eva donated her pieces, but you get an idea from her own pictures there of some of the things that she did. And things were a little annoying at Julova as well, <laughs> because they wouldn't give her an apartment. This was, you know, living space was a huge premium. So after about a year and a half, she opted to take a job in Moscow. And can we have the next one, please? Um, to back up and to try and really compress this. When they were starting out arranging the first show trial, when Stalin and his key group of political advisors were arranging this, they needed some way to implicate Trotsky. And they've, um, not an expert in this area, caveat, so if someone is, please jump in. But they decided that a young, uh, young man from Prague named Valentin Olberg, a, Ger a German speaker, was going to be implicated as a terrorist. And they created this huge story around him and started arresting everyone he knew. Among those wa was a chemist who worked at Lomonosov briefly, a guy called Mikhail Bukovsky. And as they started to fan out, as they arrested each person, each person would shortly after two or three days, the first thing they would do, by the way, is arrest you, isolate you, and leave you for a week without explaining what was going on. And then they would come back and say, do you have any names to give us? Hell yes, here's my mother's. You know, who do I would have? I'm a big chicken. Um, they all gave up names. Wachowski gave up basically that entire list you see there. His cousin, people he worked with, and this ranges from chemist to, to a shoe repair person. And all of these people were created, were sort of fictionalized into a great attempt on the life of Stalin working in various cities, mostly with German-speaking Jewish immigrants. And they were all arrested. And when they were arrested, they were kept in um, what you see there is a VIP cell for a very dangerous foreign terrorist. And that's the sort, that's not Eva's cell, but that's exactly the kind of cell that she was isolated in for 18 months. And the document you see on the left is is the death lists. The very first group of people to be shot were all of the young people associated, the German speakers associated with this Valentin Olberg and Mikhail Bukowski. Their names, Bukowski and his cousin, are names number 11 and 12 on that list. We don't even know when they were shot. But um, these lists were presented to the Central Committee and what you see up there in the corner is um, the signatures of Central Committee members. In this case, just Molotov had to sign. 
and uh, a group called Memorial in Russia has sued so that these records are permanently scanned and online and can never be removed, no matter what the current government, which way it moves. So these are permanently available. Throughout the time Eva was in prison, she refused to sign. She refused to give up. There was one brief wavering mo moment, but Soviet jurisprudence was apparently um, fastidious in its need for a confession. And because she refused to ever confess, they never shot her. And the kind of strength it takes to maintain that for 18 months, at one point they left her entirely alone for six months. They did not properly feed her, as they were supposed to do with foreigners to maintain outward appearances. They did not let her see family. But the strength to maintain that through the entire experience is extraordinary. So with that, I'll turn it over to our next speaker. I want to say that Karen is not only our good friend, but Vice President of Russian Art at Sotheby's and a great Russian expert. And our iBook has a, um, an essay by Karen, a very thorough, good essay. And she translated all the files from the KGB files, the, the transcripts of the interrogations. And it also has a couple of other essays, one by an FBI investigator who solved some mysteries in a very interesting way of Eva's um, imprisonment. Since this is a literary, this is sponsored by literary people and the Pen Club, I wanted to say that many of Eva's um, prison experiences were used in Arthur Kostler's Darkness at Noon. Not only the details, but one of the main characters was based on Eva's great love. And um, Kostler and, and she had gone to kindergarten together and were friends all their lives, lovers for a while. And uh, he asked her to relate all her prison experiences, which she did after she came out. He himself had just come out of the uh, Spanish prison. So I thought, let's see here. Uh, one second. Tal, yeah. where are you? Technical assistance. Yeah, here we go. Technical assistance, my lovely daughter. Um, all these stories of Eva's uh, time in Russia and time in the prison, w her family has heard all, all our lives. And they've become folklore in our family. And, and at a certain point, we insisted that she record them and write them. And I wanted to play just about one minute of excerpts of Eva telling uh, these stories, or bits of them. And those are in the, the iBook version. So I hope you can hear it. One minute. I could, with my feet, clean this apple so that the whole uh, spider stayed absolutely intact. It alarmed him greatly. <laughs> How could I do that without a knife? But before I forget, I want to tell you that one day I they forgot a can of something in my thing, in my. As I can, in, in the, they forgot to take it out, so I hid it. And I took with my two hands a can, which is very difficult, and I tore it into pieces. And I kept in my shoe a piece of this metal. I don't know what I did with the other, but I kept always a knife with me, and there was a piece of metal with me all the time. Okay, I just want to get, tell, can, I want to just get to the third one for later. Okay, so I'm going to read a few uh, excerpts from, um, from her prison memoirs, and I'm going to try to read some that are not in, in what you have. So the first part is fellow prisoners. 
For 13, for 16 months, I lived in, so, tell, this, I touched it. <laughs> for 16 months, I lived in cell number four. During that time, I had many neighbors, even some roommates. My first neighbor, in number five, seemed to be a perfectly sober, normal person. She was a dentist from Artangels, I think, a social revolutionary. Through the faucet, which I had jiggled enough to be able to talk through and also to smell through, whenever somebody new came into number five, I always knew because she had perfumed soap, and this perfumed soap could be smelled through the carefully jiggled faucet. But after some time, she started to repeat on and on and on, whatever it is. What evil did I do? What terrible thing did I do? When somebody came into her cell, I heard him say, why do you bite your hands? They are bloody. Why do you bite your hands? She was punishing herself by biting her knuckles and repeating over and over, what evil have I done? What she had actually done, she told me later, was to accuse innocent people. Apparently, she just gave up and nodded yes to everyone they asked about, and they were all arrested, and she went off her rocker. My neighbor in cell number three tried to commit suicide by hanging herself. Her name was Natasha, and she was accused of belonging to a social group. Someone had involved the rest of the group by saying something that by law had to be denounced, and by not denouncing this person, everyone was now involved. It was quite clear to me that at that time, there was German activity in Russia, and that was the type of group she belonged to. I had already taught Natasha how to knock on the wall so we could talk to each other. I had seen it in a Russian movie showing how the old revolutionaries knocked on the prison walls to communicate with each other, and they had shown in the movie the grid and the letters, and the same grid was engraved on the wall of the prison shower. I saw it in the shower, and I think that reminded me of the movie. I saw Natasha only once on the way to the shower. She was a very tall, blonde girl with straight braids, completely straight, blonde braids down to her ankles. After Natasha tried to hang herself, they came into her cell to cut her down, and I heard her shout and cry. And much later, I knocked to find out what had happened. They beat me, she answered. I knocked back, saying I thought they had cut off her braids. When she asked why, I said, because they're so practical to hang yourself with. <laughs> she knocked immediately, ha, ha, ha. Laughing through the wall like this was very funny. That was Natasha. In number five, I knew several people, three at least, and one was Galina, a young married woman. I saw her once when she was being taken to the shower and my little peephole was not completely closed. There was a little moon left open. She had short hair. She was a very young, very nice girl, completely apolitical. Through the faucet, Galina and I developed a great friendship. She got the books I recommended with very good menus. The best menus you could find, Dickens, always had very good things to eat. So had Gogol, so had Cellini. After a while, we talked in Cellini's terms. I have a dagger that goes through your heart and such things. We never discussed sex. I was completely frigid when I came out. But we did not mind indulging in food. We read about it with great pleasure. The longer the menus, the better the book. But after this, Galina was told she was going to be put in a much worse prison. Ours was really a very good prison. It had a toilet, it was clean, more or less. And before she left, she came to the faucet and she said, Yeva Alexandrovna, you will be my lightest memory throughout my life. And then she left. That was Galina. Then there was another woman who sang Offenbach. She was not there very long, just a couple of days. You were not supposed to sing or to whistle. You were not to make any noise except give your name when the guard came to take you out. You were not even supposed to hum a song. But she did. She sang Offenbach, Orpheus in the Underworld, or La Belle Hélène. She was a high party functionary and was arrested for having guaranteed an affidavit. 
The rule was that anybody who guaranteed for anybody else got the same prison sentence. Here was a high party functionary who had stood up for someone else. She knew she was facing her trial that night. There's no real trial, of course. At midnight, there are people sitting there and they say you are either to be shot or sentenced to 10 years labor or whatever. And there she was humming these Offenbach tunes, very gently, very quietly, very sweetly. And I asked her if she did not want to think about her case, about her defense. She said she had vouched for someone, so there was nothing to think about. And she continued singing deep into the night until she was taken away. Do I, Tal, do I have this here? We just play them. This is a little, Eva's taking over for a minute. The third one, third one. So this girl had gone to a German school. There were German schools and French schools and others. And one day, she came back from her investigation and said that the investigator had told her something she could never repeat. It was so horrible. And it was just terrible what they did to people here. I told her to try to repeat it. And she whispered, Donna Vetta. That means thunder weather, like you would say darn it in English. She was so irritating and so pompous and stupid that I could not resist educating her a bit upside down, like telling her that Hamlet was a musical and Africa, and Africa a mountain. <laughs> I told her many things, so she left very well educated. <laughs> and then for there, I, there was this prostitute in my cell. She was there about six or seven days. She wanted to use the time very well. So she asked me how foreigners make love. She wanted to know all about it because she knew there was very much to be learned. And I am not really going to tell you all she told me, but she did give me some very important advice. <laughs> When we had nothing to do, my prostitute roommate and I tried to see how many different types of dogs each of us knew, St. Bernard, Dachshund, etc. We had to move the time somehow. But then she started to say, well, Stalin is really terrible. Oughtn't he be killed? Or some such thing. To this I said, I'll call the guard if you don't shut up. She was just a very stupid agent provocateur, I think, because later I noticed her washing the floor outside the cell, which meant that she was a criminal, not a political prisoner. I don't know exactly how subtle she was, but it was quite clear that she was there as an agent provocateur. So I had the prostitute for six or eight days and the nurse about four months. And that was all there was for the next six months. For all but the last few days of my imprisonment, I was not only alone, but nobody talked to me. I was not called out. And during that time, uh, Eva wrote poems, and she was sure that she would be called out and shot any day. And I'm going to read you just one of the poems. She wrote them in German, but this is uh, her translation into English. The German is better. The German is in the iBook, too, German and English. It's called Gallows Humor. Oh, let me not despair and collapse when that last hair snaps. Let God sit at one side of my cot. Let this all-powerful good ghost protect me from the gruesome frost. But on the other side, let old Gallows Humor ride. With his gnarled hand, I reckon, he will gently stroke me and beckon and plant into my mind a small joke of some kind. Let a little burst of laughter be the bridge to my hereafter. Ah. It's beautiful, huh? So now comes a jollier part when she is 
um, expelled. So one day they called her out the, after these six months. She thought she was being called out to be shot, but no. They called her out to tell her that she was being expelled from Russia, and they gave her a new passport and a visa through Poland. Then they uh, put her back into her cell. After 16 months of being a very good prisoner, never in any way making any fuss, I started banging at the door and shouting, my God, my God, I'm going to miss my train. Eventually, the Corpus Noi brought me two suitcases. I did not know my mother had sent any suitcases, but she had. She thought I was going to Siberia and wanted me to have warm clothes. So there were these two heavy suitcases. Then they took me to the place where you wait when you first come into prison. They took out a document that said when I had arrived, you came in May 1937, the guard read aloud. No, I said, May 36. People usually only stayed six months because that was the maximum time for an investigation. Why I stayed a year and four months, I don't know, but I had been there longer than anybody else. So a lieutenant was there who was supposed to take me to the border, and he asked me what I wanted for the trip. Toothpaste, I told him. Toothpaste? But you must have pomaduchku and pudruchku, lipstick and powder. I told him I did not need pudruchku and pomaduchku, I needed toothpaste, but it did no good. He asked me what shade of pudruchku I used, and I told him Rachel, a sort of brownish pink. So I sat in this place where there was a big clock, and I just watched the clock, knowing the train was leaving very soon. I was extremely nervous. If there was one thing I did not want to do, it was to stay in that prison. But I sat and waited while he went off to find Rachel Pudruchku. Suddenly he appeared, put his hands up, and exclaimed, I couldn't get Rachel, I could only get this other color. By that time, the train was about to leave. There were four other guards, and they all took me and the suitcases, and we ran out to a large black limousine. Either you travel in a large black limousine, like in the movies, or in a prison van. So we got into the limousine. Two guards with bayonets sat in front and two in back with me. When we arrived at the train station, we jumped out of the limousine, my guards running with the heavy suitcases, and came to the train just as it started slowly moving, we just barely made it. And I began to laugh, because I always just barely make the train, you see. It's true. <laughs> so the guards tossed up the suitcases, and the four of us jumped onto the train. So the two guards and the lieutenant were to accompany her on this two-day trip to the border. Uh, they had to spend the night in Minsk on the way, and uh, one of the guards, who had by that time taken a, sh taken a shine to Eva, uh, said that he was going to call ahead and maybe they could, she could stay in a hotel. But no, the, the rule was she had to stay in a prison. But he said, don't worry, it's a very good prison. We prepared it for ourselves. <laughs> So when the conductor came, oh, I forgot to say, when the conductor came, he saw that they had first class tickets and I had to go third class. It was very hard for them to convince him that they were guarding me and therefore we had to be together. So the next day after Minsk, I was taken out and joined on the trip from Minsk to the border by two other former prisoners. One was a German math teacher who had a red afro because his hair had been cut everywhere the same length and it stood out. The other was a small, lively Polish spy. The Polish spy had been in one of the camps for nine years with water up to his knees and said proudly, now I will be hailed as a hero in Poland. He'd been a bookkeeper originally, but now he was going home to be a hero. When we finally came to the border, the three of us were taken into the office of the head of the NKVD, the KGB, who sat behind a large desk. Each one of us had a guard behind him with a bayonet. The NKVD man asked us whether we held any grudges or had any bad feelings about Russia. We all signed saying that we had no grudges. And then he gave us each $10 to spend on the other side of the border. Whoever has any Russian money left can buy sausage or something to take along. Since I had money, mother had sent me some to buy cigarettes, the others asked me to buy them sausage and vodka, which I did. So I bought for everybody, and the head of the secret police found this whole thing very funny, and he said, well, now you can order some dinner. 
At the border was a very elegant in-tourist restaurant for visitors, but we sat in the NKVD office. In came a waitress with a white apron and a menu. The menu was passed from one to the other, and since I had the money, they asked me if they could have this or that, and then ordered it. They brought in a table with a white damask cloth, china, glassware, and heavy silver. Then came the waitress with all these goodies, and I sat at the head of the table, and behind each one of us stood a very hungry guard with his bayonet. First came a big metal tureen on a pedestal full of borscht with sour cream next to it, and the man at the desk said, Eva Alexandrovna, you are the little hostess, why don't you serve? So I was the little hostess giving everybody his borscht and smetana, and we had this very elegant meal on China after none of us had had anything but an aluminum bowl and a wooden spoon for years. When the train came, we were given a whole compartment to ourselves. The three of us and the three guards jumped on. And when the train slowed down at the border, the guards jumped off. We were so excited that we ran back and forth in the corridor. It was the first time we were able to walk without anybody behind us. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Karen, Istvan, Jean, to celebrate Eva's birthday. Thanks for, for all of you to come and celebrate this exceptional life. And please look at the ebook and the public space to read more about this really amazing life. Thank you. We and questions? We actually decided not to have questions. We're going to linger on a little bit, and we'll, we'll, have, we'll have a chance to talk and grab a little wine, unless... Should we? All right. Okay. So if you let's let just if you have any questions, we still have some. I saw we were yeah, closing, but if you have any questions, the floor is open for a few questions. Before I really, I was, I was, I wanted to, to ask you, Jean, and the family. Eva showed extremely strong talent as a writer. Did she write anything else besides the prison memoir? Lots. She wrote lots of uh, autobiographical things very nicely, and she wrote us endless long letters <laughs> when we were children. And she wrote poems for us as children. Uh, and she sang songs and made them up. So she, she always wrote, but she didn't write a particular fiction. It was mostly about her life, uh, or letters, or poems. She's really a remarkable, remarkable writer. Any questions? Um, I'm wondering, did Eva speak easily of her time in prison from when she first got out, or was there a period of time when she didn't talk about it and then it came out later? That, I think, often happens. She always talked to us, her family, about it, but she didn't want at all to make it public in any way and until it, in the 1980s. She was afraid either that the cage, they had, by the way, I forgot to tell you, they had asked her to spy for them, given her uh, disappearing ink and everything, and asked, gave up specific things they wanted her to spy about. So she was afraid, and she never spied, that they might follow her here, as they had other people and killed them. And uh, she also didn't want to, to distract from the designs. And she was right, because now I see, since it came out, that everyone's talking about Russia. And she was concerned about her designs and wanted that to be the focus. But she, she was finally, she made it public in the New Yorker. Uh, there was a New Yorker profile in the 80s. And that woman convinced her to tell about it. In the book that's available on the internet, which I understand costs only eight dollars, um, isn't there something about the KGB man who then who interrogated her and then defected? And can you tell us about that? This is really a, a very amazing story. When Eva was arrested. Uh, the first week in prison, there was a, a man who came from the Kremlin, she was in St. Petersburg, and interviewed her. 
he was very well spoken. It was a beautiful office and at midnight he would bring in caviar sandwiches. And she had the feeling he really wanted to know if she had tried to kill Stalin, which of course she hadn't. And um, she described him as well spoken, well educated and quite attractive. And when we wanted to put together this ebook, I remember that she had read a book, Eva had read a book in the 50s uh, by Alexander Orloff called The Secret History of Stalin's Crimes. And she had seen references to uh, her accuser in that book. She felt that this person who wrote the book really knew a lot about. So when we were going to put the book together, I wanted to see if this man had maybe some notes that he had mentioned Eva. Um, and I, he had died, but there was an FBI guy who has the uh, essay in the book. And the FBI guy had been this Alexander Orlov's close friend and debriefer and his executor. And I said, maybe since you debriefed him, uh, there may be some notes about Eva. And he was very uh, FBI-ish on the phone. He said, well, you send me an email or whatever. But I had the feeling there was something in his mind. And uh, this Alexander Orlov, who wrote the book, uh, had been a very high up general in, in Russia. He had been stationed in Spain. And when it was time, he was friends with Stalin and all the other people. And when they called him back to kill him, he knew to leave. And in 1938, he took his family and they went to America and lived undercover for till he died. And finally, the FBI guy, after asking Eva many questions, and which she remembered very well, said, you know, Alexander Orlov told us, told me one evening that he had been sent by Stalin to interview this artist who had come from Germany and she was kind of bohemian and adventurous and quite attractive. They both said they would. And um, that I was supposed to, f Stalin wanted me to find out if she had really tried to kill him. And I reported back that she had not. And in my opinion, she was innocent. So it was Orlov himself who had interviewed Eva at Stalin's behest. And we just found this out a, a year ago through the FBI guy. It was very interesting. Any, any questions? So once again, thank you for all to make this happen. And happy birthday, David.